Welcome back to Focus on Interesting, interesting things. things. Today we have a very special guest. It's main man Keenan. A nerd. Nerd. Uh, I gotta admit, I'm playing a little bit of catch up here. Um, I don't know if you know this, but the reason you're here is we had a last minute cancellation. We were supposed to have Keanu Reeves on. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it, so we're stuck uh, with an, another rock and roller here who's got some other product uh, he uh, has made in his basement, apparently, so. I s actually stayed up really late last night and prepared a bunch of questions for Neo and his mm -hmm. experiences with F Lawrence Fishburne mm -hmm. and what kind of that dynamic was like on the set. Well, I'm a speed freak. Um, I love his work in that film, um, and I wished he was in Speed too. Like we do every week, we mm -hmm. have a guest that has a very interesting thing that mm -hmm. they'd like to show to the world. Uh, Maynard, what do you have for us today? Uh, I make wine in Arizona. Just the kind of wine you can get at a supermarket with for cooking, or? Uh, you could cook with it, but uh, I don't, you, I'd prefer you drink it. It's... You know, Tim was actually telling me he went to the yeah. grocery store and there's... You know, hundreds there's of, hundreds of wine available. He said he looked down yeah. an aisle and he said he could only see wine bottles as far as a man mm -hmm. could see. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily categorize it as, as an interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, my problem with wine is the tart, uh, acidic flavors and the way that it doesn't uh, make you feel well later. It, it, it's not, it's not something I'd recommend, would you? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I make wine. I'm a, I'm a winemaker. But is it something you'd recommend people drink? When yeah. I go to the grocery okay. store, <laughs> when, I look at, when I look at a bottle of wine, I see a big logo that says, women don't drink, children don't drink, mm -hmm. men don't drink, between uh, zero and eight. seniors don't drink. Mm -hmm. And, I, and uh, that kind of a warning to me says, hands off, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to drink this poison. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know where you're getting that. It doesn't say that you shouldn't, that men should. You think the people should be drinking this stuff that you have in the bottle? Yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> That's just where we're gonna have to differ with that. If Keanu is here, I could ask him. Yeah. So, Maynard, I have a silly question for you. Why do you think people like to drink wine? I don't think there's a simple answer to that one. Do you want the hippie answer or the obvious yeah. answer? Let's try the hippie answer. In the, in the movie, The Fifth Element. 
Mila Jovovich, the uh, supreme being. Mm. They're showing you DNA structure of a, you know, a human. It's double helix, DNA strand. And then all of a sudden they start reconstructing the supreme being and it's, you know, 64 pairs or some crazy number of, uh, of DNA strands that make up this much more complex being. Just the, the complexity within a grape is so far beyond other fruits. Um, you just end up, when you make, when you ferment them and you uh, consume them later, just the complexities that come out of, out of, the, out of those, that enzyme structure and everything that goes on in that glass, it's a supreme being. It almost suggests that this thing is just so far evolved and so much more complex um, and has so much more of a history than uh, the other fruits, which is probably on some level why we respond to it and, uh, and embrace it. That's my hippie explanation. Other than, you know, get drunk at prom, get those panties off. So why do you think people like to get drunk? They don't like wearing panties? I don't know. Hello, I'm Marshall Trimble, official Arizona State historian. And I'm here on the scenic Verde Canyon Railroad, right alongside the Verde River in Verde Canyon. Perched on the side of Cleopatra Hill here is the town of Jerome. The Billion Dollar Copper Camp, it was called, and others called it the wickedest city in the West. Well, it had a wild reputation, and it also burned completely to the ground three times in its history. It even became a ghost town for a while. And then it came back alive, and bigger than ever, I guess. Then a man named Maynard Keenan in the mid-1990s, he came out to the wickedest city in the West, and there he met up with Eric Golomsky. By golly, they started growing grapes. I came to Arizona in my teens, um, in the 80s, late 80s, to go to college. And Arizona was kind of a place where I became conscious as a human being, so I've always felt this really strong affinity to Arizona. And I think Maynard, when you get a chance to talk to him, would express, he would, he'll, he probably has some kind of parallel story about finding home and, and relating to a place. And so in a nutshell, I'm here because Arizona's my home and my wines are an expression of a place that I call home. I'd had a dream about being in Arizona, and I had no real interest in moving to Arizona. Um, nothing against Phoenix, but it wasn't really where I wanted to live, and that's my only exposure to Arizona was that, which is, of course, the first criticism that people have or, or question when we say we're growing grapes here. They say, isn't it a desert? Isn't it full of cactuses and you know cement and uh, ex strippers? And the answer is not necessarily up here. So Tim Alexander brought me up here to show me this little town in northern Arizona. Brought him up here and was like, this is it, you know, on the side of the mountain overlooking all this great, vast beauty. It's artists and musicians and a lot of creative people, and I think the energy's here, and he fell in love with it and uh, stayed here, so. And then I split, got the hell out. Northern Arizona, in general, away from the cities, you can see the stars forever, you can see the Milky Way. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing, sitting there with a bottle of Chef de Nuit du Pop. Um, checking out the sky. The full moon was kind of highlighting some of the landscape. It just it felt like a few of the times I've been on the road in Europe. Those long, long, long bus rides and all of a sudden you wake up and you're on some two, you know, two track highway going to some festival and you're in the middle of vineyards. It just really kind of hit me that this area is ripe for it. And I fell in love with it right away and it didn't take long for me to start having visions of grapes on these slopes.
I kind of got a wild hair at my ass to actually uh, plant these vineyards. And I, I, you know, I'm one of those people that kind of trust my intuition and kind of went with it. But at some point, your intuition only can go so far. Now you need some technician or somebody who has experience to kind of help you get to the next step. So I started looking around the valley just to see if there's anybody around here doing this at all. And as it turns out, there were a couple people. I was helping another winery get off the ground, but I was planning on going off on my own. So I kind of said, hey, man, let's, let's get together sometime. We met up here overlooking this vineyard, and we've been working together ever since. I think we found out that we had a lot in common as far as our drive, both from the, our interest in sustainability and agriculture, but also our interest in, in our entrepreneurial sides. It just immediately made sense. Within a few, within like three conversations, we knew that we were gonna be, I was gonna end up being guided by this person. I left the Santa Cruz Mountains making wine to David Bruce, and I said, well, you know, why'd you go to Arizona? And the difference is, did I wanna just be another vineyard and winery right next to everybody else, and just do what they're doing, change it a little bit, and say, okay, here's who I am, versus coming here and trying something completely different. And in doing that, it means we have to dial things, and we have to, you know, we really are on a frontier. We don't know what is around the next bend, and that certainly goes for these viticultural efforts. This is Merkin West, and you know, we're on a hill slope here, kind of southeasterly facing, overlooking the Verde Valley. And what you're looking at here is kind of the subsoils underneath uh, Maynard's Cab Vineyard. This whole valley below us here used to be an ancient lake bed. And it's possible that this material here are old sediments that sat in the, in the bottom of that lake. And that would help explain a little bit why some of these um, rocks are smoothed Maybe they were deposited there by rivers, or maybe water was working on them over time. This ultimately is going to be what gives Maynard's wines their character. So not only are we on a frontier here with regards to you know, Arizona, but we're on kind of a frontier here with viticulture and the idea of expressing this place that is Maynard's Vineyard. And it's unlike any other Cabernet I've ever had before. Eric at some point had either called me or over dinner had talked about meeting this rock star. He said, well, his name is Maynard Keenan, and I think his band is Tool, I think. The way he presented it was pretty funny. Something about the cellar working and this car rolls up, big black car, and this guy gets out, and I think a girl with a leash or a collar and black leather, kind of like a female Wolverine, gets out of the car. That's, no. What, I'm gonna roll into a fucking vineyard with a chick and a dog collar? Come on, dude. So you, you dispute that, that story? I completely dispute that because I wouldn't, I wouldn't roll into a vineyard with somebody like that. I mean, that's not, it's not, look at me, dude. I'm not, you know, what am I, Ozzy Osbourne out right now? I love Ozzy, don't get me wrong. But we're not shouting at the devil right now. We're not uh, barking at the moon or any of that stuff. We're just, it's just, we're in the, we're in the fucking woods. We're out here digging in dirt. Uh, no dog collared eyeliner chicks allowed. That's just embarrassing. I met Maynard back in 93 on a tour called Lollapalooza. He came walking up. Who's this crazy guy? He's got like this mohawk. I think he had army fatigues on or something. I was like, who is this guy? You know, one thing that Maynard has done is that he's sold a shit ton of records. He's an incredibly successful person, and he's, you know, what they call a rock star. He is a guy who made it. Only probably the biggest genius in the entire world. Singer of Tool, singer of Pussifer, singer of Perfect Circle. <laughs> he's a very sexual, very, you know, human being. You know, he's in tune with himself. God amongst men. <laughs> I don't, really don't know what to say. It's, uh, it's Maynard. Our best concert oh. experience was New Orleans. It was a big festival, 80,000 people general admission, and we were third row. And it was just outstanding. The crowd just moved us, and we thought we it were going to die. It was just... <laughs> He's a beautiful voice. Beautiful voice, his and the words. way he mixes it up. His voice, literally his voice, not his artistic voice, his physical voice, is, I think, at this point, something that will be heard and listened to as long as people are still listening to rock music that involves you know, bass, guitar, and drums. I love drawing people, and his lyrics are like a muse to me. This guy right here, 
Maynard. We named him after the guy from Tool, man. <laughs> We've been listening to them since we were 13. We're going to be 23 soon, so it, it'd be a good decade. Yeah. A decade of Tool. That was <laughs> fucking awesome. That was awesome just to see him for a whole uh, point two, <laughs> 0.2 seconds. 0.2 seconds was well worth the wait. Uh -huh. My perception of Maynard moving uh, to Arizona to make wine was probably similar to a lot of other people's. There was a bit of skepticism. I think there's always a bit of skepticism uh, when somebody who's known for one thing decides that they want to do something else. You know, when Paul Stanley from KISS says, oh, I'm going to start painting, you're like, oh, this is not going to be any good. And then you look at the paintings, and it's not any good. I was just like, oh, OK, dude's got a lot of money. He's, you know, he's moving to Arizona, and he's going to, like, you know, try his hand at this. And then it became sort of clear very quickly that this was not some sort of dilettante, you know, oh, maybe I'll try making some wine. This was a passion for him. So, I Maynard, mean, I guess what everyone wants to know is, you know, why did you get into winemaking? How and what did you fall in love with about wine? Yeah, I get that. I get that question a lot. I guess I could ask, you know, I could retort with, you know, why music? I think it's just everyone has that moment when they discover something on their own that wasn't handed to them that kind of resonates on some certain level that that you know drives them to ask more, and it's kind of you know, a self-fulfilling thing. You kind of you know you're kind of learning about yourself. It's a matter of self-discovery, and then you ask more questions, and you make a sound, and uh, it's your sound, and it resonates on some certain level. And, and with me, it was with winemaking. I had that same moment where I was you know having the right wine with the right dinner, and something clicked, and it just compelled me to to want to know more about what that's about and how it relates to my world and this world I'm living in, and how far can I take this as an artist? Um, are you guys going to follow me everywhere? I graduated from Prescott College with a degree in ecology, but I specialize in riparian ecology or river ecology. One of my first big contracts was to do an inventory of uh, perennial streams in the Prescott National Forest. And in two years, I must have hiked, you know, thousands of river miles without air. There was always a quince tree, apple, or pear there. At that time, I was already making beer, and I, I just took an initial interest in the fruit because I got excited about the idea of getting some of these heirloom apples that I had come across in my hikes hiking them out, pressing them, and making them into apple wine. I took the apples, went through the whole process, and I'll never forget the first whiff I had of that apple wine. It brought me back there. I could smell those grasses. I could hear the little babbling brook. I could smell the ponderosas. And it was really epiphanous for me. This, this was the moment that, that made me into a winemaker. Winemaking is something that helps us understand our relationship with the Earth and with each other. There's a lot of situations where we disrespect the Earth. We manage our resources poorly. Um, we litter. We overextract resources. Um, it all comes down to whether we really understand what's going on around us and whether we're sensitive to it. Do we have a responsibility to the Earth? Do we have a responsibility to ourselves to attune our senses to all these things around us? And I know, I know this almost seems hokey, but that sense of taste and smell brought me to a deeper level of understanding of myself and the planet. It's like somebody saying God spoke to them. And to me, the earth is really kind of my church, is my God, and that was my religious experience. My name is Craig Martinson, and I'm the vineyard manager here at Page Springs. When we prune the vines, we're really setting up the vineyard for this next year. I uh, know I want to set about three tons of fruit per acre uh, in this section. And so uh, based on vine counts, if I leave two buds per spur, and I space the spurs about the distance of my hand apart, I know I'll get that. I'm also pruning the vines, and I'm leaving my my buds here, they're all concentrated right along this cordon. 
Sometimes we'll taste like here it's bleeding. Taste that to see if it's sweet at all. Uh, there's no sugars really flowing in the vines, and uh, I guess that's the uh, farmer's almanac way of testing things, seeing how far they're they're along. My name is Feather Jones, and I am an herbalist, a land journey guide, and a ceremonialist. Grandmother, grandfather, great spirit, and spirit keepers of the four directions, I honor you and I acknowledge you for your many gifts. This is a prayer the indigenous people use in order to move into a place of power. And the vortexes are places of power. Vortex is kind of a cool, groovy name, but it was not known with the ancient people. Sacred places of power, and they knew them all. And these places offer a very strong earth resonance where the electromagnetic energies are concentrated. So it's easy to walk into them and feel the energies. I am a vortex. I am a, I am a, I am a, I am a mobile vortex. I don't have my costume on right now, but I normally have like a, it's a big V with a cape. I am, a, I am a vortex. Well, you should dispute this with the Sedona map because you're not on the map. <laughs> I, I, well, it's because I didn't donate to their chamber of commerce. They took me off the map, and it was hard to. They just kept having to reprint it. Every time I moved, I'd have to reprint the map because I'm a moving vortex. Let me say something to you. Please. The blood of Christ is essentially wine. Correct. Who are you to put that in a bottle? Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, that's. There's a couple things we know about life. Can we just open one? Or just... Okay. Go Listen, ahead. it's a free country. Hey, open let's... the wine. If he wants to open the wine so much, he's probably not. He's yeah. probably has a problem with alcohol. I would just. You know, if you were running your own talk you're right, show. You're right, this is your. At, at that point, you could say, I'm gonna interview you, then we're gonna open the wine, then we're gonna talk about the wine. Okay, but that's not really what's happening here. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're trying to figure out why the hell Keanu's not here. Mm -hmm. What kind of name is Keanu? That's an interesting mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. What is this now? It's just an opener. What do you do with that thing? You open the wine. Come on, <laughs> seriously, what do you do with it? And you open the wine. Sure. You use it to open the wine. And you make these things? Mm. Well, this is just a wine opener. <laughs> now, if you were if you were the inventor of a, a metal fish like that, Dennis, we gotta we get the talking. guy on the show who invents the uh, the wine opener. Get him booked. That's for tomorrow. a blast. That looks like it's a lot of fun, there, man. Yeah, it's great. If I had that thing, I'd buy the cheapest wine and I'd open it up. It would be a blast. I'd have my sons join me in that pursuit, and then I'd just pour the wine down the drain because I would never drink wine. You don't like wine. Well, I would not know, sir, because I also have never drinking piss. <laughs> so I wouldn't know what that tastes like, but I certainly wouldn't drink it. Douchebags. Oh, isn't that a neat little device? This is the uh, theory of civilization, according to Tom. Most people accept the idea uh, that civilization as we know it grew up in the Tigris-Euphrates area, and that the main civilizing factor for man was wheat primitive wheat before a man got his hands on it. it kind of looks like Bermuda grass. You get this little stock with these tiny little seeds on it. And I said to myself, if I'm a caveman back in the day and uh, I'm dragging my lady around by the hair and I got a club in one hand and I see Bermuda grass and I see a grapevine, I mean, you know, which one am I going to go for first? Well, of course I'm going to go for the grapes. As it happens, the Southern Caucasus in what used to be the old Soviet Republic of Georgia is the origin of Vetus vinifera. They have moved around the planet by the simple process of man saying, ooh, I like those, I'm gonna take some with me. So it moved down the hill, worked into the Tigris Euphrates, and then slowly spread, especially throughout the Middle East, over into Persia, into what is now Iran, and became um, the center of the grape growing regions. The Greeks got real good at carrying the grapes around, but the kings obviously were the Romans. Being the engineers that they were, introduced these grapevines all over the Western world. And what they're now finding, they can do DNA analysis on residue that they found in amphora, in sunken ships in the Mediterranean, that they found in uh, 
uh, burial tombs uh, that they found in the pyramids in Egypt. And guess what? All those guys were drinking Cabernet and the same grapes that we're drinking. So my thinking is that actually civilization arose because of these guys saying, you know, those taste pretty good. And then you know one day they had a bunch of grapes and they stuck them in a container of some kind and forgot about them for a while. Well, then they just got better. Hey, Maynard, could you tell us a little about what you guys are doing today? Planting uh, marijuana, medicinal marijuana. Uh, we're basically replanting on uh, what is considered Merkin South. Uh, this is our large, this, this vineyard is, has given us the most challenge. The reality is I really don't have to think too hard to talk about all the struggles associated with creating something like this here. Right from the get-go, when I first saw this piece of land here, I just knew this is where I wanted to be. There were a lot of hard times, times when Eric was ready to, you know, throw in the towel. One of the biggest hurdles is that our local government really had no perception or no track record on how to deal with somebody like me. Here I was a farm business, but then I had a production business and a commercial business all kind of rolled into one. I purchased this vineyard back in, uh, I think, 03. Our first year and a half, we actually lost a lot of vines to winter kill. We weren't putting the vines to sleep. We weren't you know, pushing them into dormancy early enough. So this is the fourth time we planted this vineyard, hopefully the last. Everywhere where you see tubes out in the vineyard is a place where we lost a vine to winter cold. Not only is it costing us more time, we also had to replant the vineyard and really start over down in this section. Cost of planting grapes in Arizona runs about $35,000 an acre, and that's not nothing. That's a lot of money. And then if you put in a winery, you're looking at, you know, at least a couple million dollars for a halfway decent winery on top of your land, your grapes, all the money you've invested thus far. So the best way to make $10 million in the vineyard is to probably lose about $100 million first. Huge expensive mistakes, huge black hole of expense that goes into pioneering an industry like this. And uh, we're learning the hard way. Pioneers are going to take the brunt of the setbacks and mistakes, but we also have the opportunity to, to take all the notoriety associated with it as well. Challenges on this vineyard so far are humidity, midsummer monsoons for bunch rot, fiddle bugs, and when the grapes are ready, you got raccoons, uh, skunks, gophers, birds, hippies, all kinds of uh, pests. Camera crews. Camera crews. Uh, when I was looking for vineyards, uh, basically I basically was looking for water. That's gold here in these, these here hills. For 30 years, we have been litigating water rights in the state of Arizona. We've been back and forth to the United States Supreme Court on every issue over jurisdiction and how to quantify these water rights. There are claims to water that predate statehood. The mines actually own the water and control the water, and in the area that have been used since the late 1800s but they have an agreement with the town of Jerome as to how much they can use and for what purposes. To put vineyards on the land instead of putting a house on the land conserves the water. There's one-eighth the usage of water on a vineyard than there would be in just a basic nuclear family household. We're dealing with a plant that is indigenous to arid regions in the first place, so it's a very water conservative plant. These grapes use a, a very small amount of water. What's special about the wine grapes that uh, are growing here is they are very deep rooted plants. They will find the water table. They will get uh, seriously, seriously involved in the ground. This is not a shallow plant where you can go over and just pull it out of the ground. There's barely water here because there is a water table that's relatively just under the soil. So um, when we get to this season where the sugar levels are starting to get uh, higher up, we're noticing that we're getting a lot of bunch rot just because of the humidity. Uh, if we get just a slight bit of rain, we haven't actually got our canopy up into a quad trellis system yet to really separate off the clusters so they're not no leaf touching a cluster, no cluster touching a cluster. We haven't quite got there yet because this is still a young vineyard. We're still training these vines. Typically, the growing of grapes use less water than other traditional crops like cotton or alfalfa or corn. And because of that, it's really a great product for the Verde Valley area. 
because there isn't a lot of water to go around, and so using less water is always an important way to approach any kind of sustainable business and economic practice. My interest in sustainability and that kind of whole survivalist mentality, surviving the earth changes, paranoia that I had uh, in earlier life, and my interest in wine all of a sudden kind of came together out here in Arizona when I was noticing the landscape and how, how a lot of these creatures fight to survive. If you plant a garden in Arizona, you gotta be, you gotta be ready to defend it because every creature from, from you know, bug to fowl to mammal wants, wants your food. Here comes the story. Uh, get a panicked call about a week ago from a vineyard manager calling his brother going, I went down to Merkin East and a third of the Sangiovese is stripped right off the stems. There's no Sangiovese in four of the rows. So we're freaking out trying to figure out what happened. So we had Nikki stay the night. <laughs> a pack of javelina came through the fence and got under the nets and basically got up on their hind legs and stripped off a third of our Sangiovese grapes down to the stems. So if you don't know what a javelina is, if you've ever seen the Royal Tenenbaums, uh, the plaque that Bill Murray keeps trying to hang on the wall, on the family portrait wall, that's a javelina. It's like a wild boar. We have herds of them running around the Verde Valley. And now, uh, never mind the challenges with water rights and um, issues with frost and, and uh, cold snaps, now we have to worry about Havelina, which I think is amusing. How do you sleep at night, knowing that you're making this trash? I drink it, and then I fall asleep. Wow, OK. <clears throat> I guess we got a sarcastic uh, comedian on our show. We should reintroduce him, then. Welcome back to our show, Focus on Interesting, interesting things. things. We're here with M. Keenan, and he's the star of a new film, Bloodwine, and where we, <laughs> we go into his home <laughs> of Arizona, where the mascot of Arizona mm -hmm. is Zono the Frog. That's an interesting thing. Arizona has zero frogs, and to, to actually mm -hmm. have a mascot <laughs> named after a frog that's in a desert, in a shit world mm -hmm. that you live in, um, that was interesting to us. Now tell me about the uh, audacity that exists in your mind and in the, the mind of your friends, where you would think that someone would want to see a documentary about you and the process that you undergo to make uh, this poison. It's filth, really. Um, I'm sorry. Can't cut your tongue, or do you want? <laughs> do you want some water, some uh, a, a, a birch beer? We can get you anything non-alcoholic, or is that not suitable for you? Who wants to run out and get you some this some uh, paint thinner or something? No. Good. Those are plenty of wine left. Plenty of wine. I I have a question for you. Mm. What kind of tool do you use to make wine? <laughs> <laughs> well, because I saw that note. Did you see what I said? Yeah, because you're talking about the fish thing here. What kind of? I'm Tom Bojour, the editor-in-chief of Revolver Magazine. We've actually been covering tools since day one. One of the most important things that Tool decided to do and has managed to do was not play the media game. They've actually managed to maintain an aura of a unit of a band with a mystique. Between Maynard's lyrics and the rhythms and the, the way that the music evolves, that Tool music connects with people on a really massively wide spectrum of levels, which is why fans of theirs remain with them as they evolve. And even with The Perfect Circle, he was more open and, you know, willing to do things on his own because it was his own project. When he's in Tool, Maynard is part of Tool. I think what Maynard has always managed to do is write lyrics that you totally feel his suffering and you feel struggles, his evolution. When you're writing songs and titling them, you know, Stink Fist or Prison Sex, you know that you're pushing buttons, but he is able to connect with people's, like, inner Beavis and Butthead. When he calls something Stink Fist, he knows that it's disturbing and provocative and opens up a whole can of worms, but he also knows that it's kind of funny. I don't think any of Maynard's fans, at least until recently, had a vision of him as a happy or, you know, well-adjusted person. I'm, uh, I'm very resistant to the idea of uh, being a public servant and it being my responsibility to educate, because I'm not really qualified uh, to do any of those things. I write these songs to 
move through some pain or work out some issues. And if I'm successful in my art and my expression, I shouldn't feel the same way I did when I wrote those songs anymore, and there should be a logical progression. But if, as an artist, I can express myself in some way that ends up helping someone else get through some hard times, I guess that's, I guess that's, a, that's great for everybody. It helps, it helps uh, other people. The problem with the music industry in general is that artists get into it because they have a desire to be desired and they have a desire to scream their heads off for whatever issue happened to them in the past. They weren't armed with the proper tools to move through any trauma or their child of divorce or you know, lost their parents. You know, what they do is they end up just kind of screaming their heads off and at some point they get popular and now they're a part of an industry that is run by people who are uneducated emotional people. In a way it's kind of a dead end. In this society we expect those artists to continue screaming to the end of their end of their days. If you don't eventually feel better, then I'm not sure how effective your screaming was and how, how your screaming is gonna help somebody else. So I should work out of those issues and move on to some other challenges. And that's for me what the wine is. I think I've moved through a lot of the problems that I've had in the past. I don't necessarily want to scream my whole life. If the songs don't help me, how are they gonna help you? So here I am making wine. It's a much more grounded experience than being in a bus, being surrounded by decadence. I just returned from uh, a short run with Tool, uh, which confirmed my suspicions that it's very grueling on my body. As soon as I got back, I collapsed and got sick for a couple days. Uh, it's very taxing. so. Uh, I think it's be I'm much happier in this setting uh, doing these things. Not that I don't enjoy making that, making that art and expressing those ideas, but uh, I just my body now feels more comfortable here. It, it, it's, uh, it's, it's more where I am in, in my progression uh, and my life path. This is just kind of where I feel more comfortable now. You can see the grapes are going into Verasion already. Some of the little green spots on these berries, that's gonna clear up over time. Once these canes are more established, uh, we're seeing in some of the older vines that you don't really get that anymore. Once it kind of finds its way and it kind of gets itself acclimated to the site over the course of you know six or seven years, it kind of it kind of gets what it needs to do to survive here. And those green berries will will start to disappear. Uh, right now, though, you know this is the third harvest, so there's, it's still kind of finding its way. Um, and it's doing really well. Yeah. Oh. Hi, uh, we're making wine in Arizona. I know the first thought is cacti and, and uh, cement and all kinds of heat, but uh, we're in the high desert. We get snow uh, in the winter and it's actually a lot cooler than, say, Paso Robles. I'm sure you've had some wines from the Paso Robles area. We have more problems with cold than we do with heat. So just to dispel that myth right away, uh, get onto the wine drinking. This is the first wine that I actually made with Eric Glomsky in Arizona. I actually lived in, I moved to LA in around uh, 1990. Uh, took only about five years for that to sink in. It was a bad idea. So in 95, <laughs> I ran screaming from your lovely city toward Arizona. Ended up in a small town called Jerome, Arizona in 95. Uh, didn't take long for me to look at the slopes there and realize that this is a place to start planting grapes. But I didn't really have any wine background. So going into this whole thing with Eric Glomsky, I'm kind of like that drunk child with a loaded weapon bouncing around the, the uh, winery going, hey, let's mix these things together. What does this taste like? Uh, and this is a direct result of that clumsiness. Uh, so uh, can you, did you hear all that in the back? Yeah. Location, location, location. <laughs> Here's some food. All right, so with this, Steph, what you make? How do you find it's time kind of to like climate. actually write music when you know so much about wine? Like, it's well, honestly, I don't wine. really know that much about wine. I'm learning as I go, and I'm learning about the winemaking process uh, over time. It's going to take it'll take a decade or two for me to really catch up with uh, with all the hot air that I'm throwing around. It's a, it's a steep learning curve, it's a quick learning curve, and then it, then it levels off and there's a lot of hard work that occurs in that last 5% that really gets you to the next level. So, but it's like music, it's about listening. It's so about, like, where, where do you see yourself in sort of 
15, 20 years? Like, do you see yourself like performing on stage or, you know, I think, growing I think the wine? stage performances will end up being uh, the fun part, the break from the winemaking. Wow. So wine yeah. is like... Go out for a few weeks, do some shows, focus on the winemaking. What do you know? Well, what my role in Potiphar is is really whatever, whatever it can be at any kind of moment. You know, I'm such a huge Maynard fan altogether. You know, I, that's creepy. I know. I know. <laughs> you get, weird to have like a crazy room? like fan Where's like the bouncers? Like, No, it's true. Security. And um, you know, so anytime Maynard sings, I want to be there. And if he asks me to sing with him, of course I will. So. <clears throat> Pussy for Jack and the next Resident Evil. <laughs> <So>. <clears throat> know anybody? Well, then we've realized that no one knows what Pussy for is. You know why? Because <laughs> no one knows what it is. Even the guy who came up with it no, doesn't know but what it is. That's not, no one knows what it is. That's the point. Right. What is Pussy for is what Pussy for is. And what not, is and, and what it isn't. <laughs> you know. It's a, uh, Pussy for is an ever evolving project, not unlike. Uh, a wine. Uh, it's when you when you put the bottle when you put the wine in the bottle. Uh, it's going to be different depending on what day or week or year you open it up. It's always going to be evolving. You're holding so, that really weird. Now, how, how do I pronounce it again? I always want to say Caduceus. Caduceus. Caduceus is the winery. Merkin mm -hmm. Vineyards are the vineyards. Merkin Vineyards. And you're not you don't have a problem that your your winery um, the middle syllable almost sounds like douche. You're, you're not worried about that. Mm -hmm. okay. Not at all. Okay. I mean. This is all, we're all, we're embracing nature. Oh, good. Well, and Three Douchebags Vineyards out of Italy is like one of the biggest producers on the planet, so it, it clearly didn't hurt them. Not only of wine, but of douchebags. Of douchebags, yeah. They do amazing, because they got the old olive oil, you know, the great vinegar. They, they make it all by hand. They, 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 they stone grind the rubber. Yeah, it's all cold pressed. It's all cold pressed. <laughs> Jesus, God. Cold so, pressed douchebags. What are we, a couple of bad morning DJs? Hey, how about that hey. douchebags vineyard? Oh, we got it here with, uh, with Maynard Keenan here from Caduceus Winery. Hey, Maynard, what's it? <laughs> Sorry. So what is this one called? <laughs> this one's called Sancha. Sancha. Yeah. Do you, you want to read the back there? I do want to read the back. Hang on. You need the glasses? Because I have No, glasses. no, I got it. You know what you should do in the, in the next back one of these? Just add one... Like, do all the technical stuff and then add one line that just makes no fucking sense. Just see if people catch it, you know? Like, personally frightened by Rhea Perlman once a week. <laughs> Insulted just, to death. Yeah, so people are just like, oh, wait a minute, why, what? Wait a minute, that's <laughs> not real. And they go to your website, you have footage of Rhea Perlman screaming in a barrel of grapes. Yeah. <laughs> personally frightened by Rhea Perlman. <laughs> now, Cheers. this isn't, thank you. This is also young. This, we're, we're, we're pouring these wines uh, way before their time. We shouldn't be pouring these at all. So we're robbing the cradle. Oh we're robbing God. the cradle. Yeah. Wow. That's got some tannic structure to Damn, it. Damn, dude. That has got some tannis. Mmm. Oh, this is what they give like a gunfighter before a, mm -hmm. before a shootout. Like, just here, get a sip of this. Yeah. It'll steady your hand, dude. Here. Oh, by the stem, you don't want to warm it. There you go. <laughs> Wine before murder. Remember that Always. movie you were pitching, Gunfighter Wine Snob? <laughs> <laughs> Gunfighter Wine Snob. Think a Cabernet is better than a Syrah, buddy? Maybe we'll take three steps back. <laughs> Gunfighter Wine Snob. Mm. So how is that piss? Yeah, how is that poison you're putting in your mouth? You know, vinegar waft coming this way. <laughs> it was like. Oh, Tim, <laughs> don't get close to that. <laughs> I, I, I can't tell you, curiosity killed the cat. Give me a little, t let me, give me a little taste. Woo, it's rank. <laughs> smells like my pepper's shoes. No, not for me, not, not for me. Hurt? Does it hurt? It tastes like my daughter's cough syrup. Mm -mm. <laughs> it does smell like fruit now that it's sort of sitting out in the air a little bit. Let me a sip of that. Feel free. Mm. 
It's got a... <laughs> when people taste wine and they are maybe intimidated sometimes because they'll be sitting there at a wine tasting and somebody will swirl that glass and take a whiff and they'll say, oh, what lovely aromas and characteristics of cassis and chocolate and tobacco and forest floor and mushroom. All these are, words are descriptors that may be applicable to that wine at that moment. Because we're such a visually oriented and stimulated culture, our vocabulary and our senses that have to do with taste and smell are really underdeveloped. It's not that they're not there, we just don't have an intellectual kind of connection and our mind doesn't connect to our vocabulary and our ability to describe those things. And furthermore, because we don't have that, we tend not to uh, pay attention to those things as much. You know, I think it's good to have some a kind of few key words that you can use, like forest floor gives you kind of an earthy character or a, an experience of an earthy character. You know, so there's a few kind of fruit terms you can use um, to kind of get people down the right path. This is dark fruit, this is blue fruit. Wine definitely does not contain um, strawberries or black cherries, but when you try to describe something, we have to use terms that we're familiar with and that everybody can kind of understand. With regards to our senses, I really kind of think we have an obligation to educate ourselves about these things because there's this whole world out there that most of us aren't even paying attention to that is huge. You want to smell flavors that are fruity and aromatic. You don't want to smell things like uh, blue cheese and you don't want to smell things like wet dog and barnyard. I mean, these are things that are also descriptors of wine, but maybe something that went wrong in the wine making process that created those flavors and smells. My wife had a great line a while ago, uh, back when Eric was just bringing us in for these random tastings, uh, she said, one of the wines was like kissing Elizabeth Taylor. 90% of the process of tasting wine is smelling wine. So you're really not tasting chocolate in the wine. It's more like your tongue and your nose come together and the effect of that flavor comes across to your brain as slightly chocolatey. Eric always amazes me, the things that he can notice in a wine. And, and I, I think I'm starting to get there. For me, essentialism really developed more through the concept of, of smell, really and somewhat taste, because taste is really all about smell. You know, if you have a cold and you eat some food or drink some wine, you can barely taste it at all. Most of what we're tasting with wine is our retronasal. So as the wine goes down the back of our throat, it volatilizes and turns into a gas and it goes up into our sinuses, and that's what we really, really smell and taste. When you really get into wine, wine just coaxes you to develop your sense of smell. 10, 15 years ago, um, I could walk into a room, I wouldn't notice that this guy used Irish Spring and then this woman's wearing perfume, or I, I wouldn't notice all the different shampoos in the room. I wouldn't notice, unless it was really extreme, that this person was exercising right beforehand. You know, I wouldn't notice that this woman was on her moon. I wouldn't notice what that we were downwind from a certain type of forest. Like this forest right here, I could smell the cottonwoods way up at my house. And somebody walks into the room, even if I don't hear them, I can tell if somebody's in the room now. And to me, that's a whole world that didn't even exist before, and I can't imagine living a life without that extra sense. It'd be like all of a sudden losing my eyesight now. Here, we're seeing an interest in the Verde Valley where major winemakers from other parts of the world and of course people from this region are really paying attention to what's happening. And so we expect to see a lot more vineyards planted here in the valley. Uh, many have already been planted in the last four or five years. Uh, we see major makers coming in and, and taking a look to see what they can capitalize on. One of the uh, fellows here in the valley, the, uh, actually the head of economic development in Cottonwood, uh, just came back from a trip to Napa, Sonoma. And he made it a point to visit as many tasting rooms as he could while he was there and said he was a little bit surprised to find out that everybody he talked to was familiar with the Verde Valley. They may not have known all of the nuances, they may not have been able to name all of the wines, but they knew something was going on out here, that the word was already out, that this was a region to kind of keep your eye on. My name is Alder Yarrow, and I run what many people consider to be the world's leading wine blog, Venography.com. I taste between three and 6,000 wines a year, and 99.9% .9 of them are not from Arizona. The world doesn't know there is wine in Arizona yet. Um, the world barely knows that there's uh, you know, wine in half the regions of California.
Here in the Livermore Valley, um, we've been farming since 1883 when first generation uh, C.H. Wente founded the winery. It's been a wonderful operation here, five generations of family involved in the business, and today we're operated by the fourth generation and have the pleasure of having our fifth generation winemaker, Carl Wente, making all of our beautiful wines. My family's been farming grapes and making wine on this land since 1883, and we're celebrating our 126 vintage this year. I think I have the best job here with the oldest family owned and operated winery in California, grow grapes and make the best wine in the world, and it's all about execution when it comes to grape growing and winemaking. It took, you know, decades to figure out what to plant in parts of California, and I think, you know, they have the advantage of watching other failures and successes in other parts of the world that resemble theirs. We're farming Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Petit Verdot, Malbec, Tempranillo, Triga National, Triga Francesca, Suzao, Marsan, Roussan, Viognier, Syrah, Senso, Grenache, Graciano, Tempranillo, Orange Muscat, Muscat, Canelli, Sauvignon Blanc, Semillon, Nebbiolo, Sangiovese, Barbera. I might have said Zinfandel or I might not. So, I mean, that's a lot, a lot of grapes. And the winery is about an 18,000 ton winery. On the sales volume side, we're about a 350,000 case brand and then we also sell grapes as well and we sell bulk wine and so when you're vertically integrated and have these beautiful estate grown vineyards it, it's you stay out in front of the growth of your main wines and so there's times where we have too much fruit so we're able to sell it and just choose the grapes and the wines that we want to come into our product. There are all sorts of hurdles for beginning winemakers and um, that's even if they're in a place that everybody knows about already like Napa or Sonoma or even you know upstate New York. Uh, folks from Arizona, you know, they got to get past the Arizona question uh, before they really get to the, okay, maybe I'll even try the wine question. The Napa Valley is, is the most recognizable wine district in, in the New World, I think. If, if you consider California the New World, um, I think when you, you look at Arizona, perhaps, you know, it's a blank slate. Maybe it's like trying to make wine on the moon. It's really only the wine geeks at this point, or perhaps people who live there, that understand that Arizona has a wine country. The big boys up in Napa seem to have it all figured out, growing grapes and selling their wines for a heap load of coin. Meanwhile, Maynard and Eric are hunkered down and working hard down in southern Arizona, harvesting grapes at their vineyard. They call that vineyard the Arizona Stronghold. Our boys are making their wine on the same plains that the mighty Geronimo waged his war against the U.S. government. The terroir is so outer-worldly that NASA recently held super-secret training there for the mission to Mars. I reckon the landscape is so similar to Mars that the boys at NASA thought it was a spitting image. Grandfather Fire, Grandmother Earth, Grandmother Cedar, I join you sacreds here in holy union that you might bring forth in our midst creation in the manner of balance and harmony. Shamanism is humanity's oldest and most enduring spiritual practice, and these ways are conversant all across the globe. With the harvest going on today, it just makes it that much more rich, vital, and alive what we're doing here. Because it's not a staged event. Rather, this is the actual blessing consecration of this vineyard. <laughs> After we stem the grapes, we put them in these, in these vats. To get the stuff cooking out here, to inoculate it, to get the grape juice into wine, we add yeasts. The yeasts are basically going to take 
the sugar in the, in the juice and convert it to alcohol. As the yeast start to metabolize the sugars, they give off carbon dioxide, they give off heat, they create alcohol. This thing starts to form what we call a cap. If I move a bunch of these grapes, watch this. If I push down here, you can see this foam, okay? And that's the beginnings of the fermentation. Making wine is a little bit like making tea. Envision these um, berries as the tea leaves. Our job as winemakers is to dunk that tea bag down into, into the water, which is the juice. One of the misconceptions that we that people have about processing the grapes and after destemming is that, you know, we all roll up our pant legs and jump in the bins and start stomping on them like Lucy. Uh, and that's not actually the case. As I'm punching through the cap, you can see that it starts to foam. This is our mixing process that's helping this color and the flavors and all the wonderful things that make a red wine what it is extract from these, from these skins. See how this thing's much denser now than the other one? This is a much more compacted cap. And watch this, okay? You might want to get the sound too. Okay, hear that? We used to just kind of indiscriminately say, okay, we're gonna add a bunch of nutrients because we want to make sure this fermentation finishes. But there are some compounds that come from yeast stress that add another layer of complexity to the wine. And we try to dial it to just, just the right point because too much of it is too much. None of it, then things are too squeaky clean. The wines that are too perfect just aren't as interesting. At some point, we free run them and we press them. And we want to basically get this stuff out first and separate that out into a bin, and we'll barrel that down. And then we'll take, you know, the skins that are kind of left on the bottom, uh, there's still juice in those, so then we, we dig those out or put those into the press, and then press those out slowly, so we get what, what we call the pressed wine out. And then they end up in one of these tanks, depending on the size of the batch. So even though we pump off liquid, there's all kinds of suspended sediments and solids in that liquid. And then we get the secondary fermentation going, and once the wine's completely done, all those solids start to settle out. Once that has occurred, we, that's usually the time we end up going to barrel. Barrels are all about aging wines primarily, but there's also a seasoning, i.e. like a chef and a spice rack, and you're adding different spices. You've got to pick the right barrel to accent and support and enhance the wine you're putting in it. But you can choose different barrels, you can choose different aging regimes, but when it really comes down to it, you get to be the chef when you start putting wines together. To me, the art of winemaking is blending. Most of our wines are blends, and that's because I love blending. I mean, do I just want to make Cabernet Sauvignon every year, or just make a Syrah every year, or do I want to tinker with it and see if I can take that wine and, and make it better? So how do you not only achieve complexity, but get these things to knit together and form this fabric that is beautiful and smooth and velvety? And again, I think this all relates back to the idea of deliciousness. My job as a winemaker is to tinker with all these different batches in here. Get to know them as grapes, then get to know them as must, get to know them as young wines, and form these relationships with these wines so that over time I start to have this kind of a mental and emotional map of how these things ought to work together. This one has something over here that's wonderful, but it's lacking something. But, oh, just the other day I was tasting this over here and I think it's got what that needs. I mean, there's nothing cooler than watching somebody drink a glass of wine or a blend that I put together and just watch them close their eyes and smile. You can see it take them away to somewhere else. I mean, to me, that's, I, I did my job. <laughs> Bottling is, is kind of the process that every winemaker rues. I'm pretty mechanically minded and I can keep this line going. And there's a bunch of complex processes that are all interacting to make this line function correctly. <laughs> Gotta be kidding me. And my job is to understand as many of those as possible so when the line breaks down, I can figure out how to get it back up as quick as possible. We've talked about the whole process today, but we haven't really talked about the end game here, which is the most important part. Today we're bottling Caduceus Premier Passo. Uh, Premier Passo means first step. This was the first wine Maynard ever conceived here with me at, at Page Spring Cellars. And as you know, Caduceus, I've helped Maynard make these wines from the get-go. This is a really neat wine, and it's unique because it's a blend of white and red grapes. Syrah blended with Malvasia. So not only is, was this his first step, this is also a great first wine for somebody who's getting into wine. It, uh, it's soft, it's aromatic, and it's not over the top. Here's what our 10 hour day, but really the culmination of almost 16 months worth of work, all coming together in this bottle right here. April 10th, 
2009. This is uh, the first time we uh, have bottled a 100% Caduceus wine from northern Arizona. All the elements that go into making up the terroir of this area, it's the limestone, the volcanic ash, the slopes, the rainfall, everything going into it. This is kind of added up to something that's far less Californian than we'd an anticipated. It's uh, much closer in profile to like a Leoville Lascasse or a, like a left bank Bordeaux. If this is what we can get out of this soil, kind of letting this soil speak for itself, then anything's possible. It's taken about nine years contemplating the areas where we were gonna plant, breaking ground, navigating local politics to even break ground. Um, very hands-on, very small site. Uh, we have just under 670 vines on this spot. Uh, no one in their right mind would plant a vineyard that's less than six acres or 10 acres just because financially it's, uh, it's just as easy to farm 100 acres as it is to farm 10 acres. Uh, so to, <laughs> to farm a half an acre is just kind of uh, silly. <laughs> but the location is special. The vineyard itself is special. It's worth taking the risk, basically. This is the first bottling of Negual del Judith, Cabernet Sauvignon from uh, Yavapai County, Arizona. Judith is uh, named after my mother, Judith Marie. She passed away several years ago. She was an invalid for uh, almost 30 years. She had an aneurysm when she was about 31. Uh, left her paralyzed on the right side of her body, and so she couldn't really do a lot of traveling. Couldn't do much of anything, really. Uh, read, write, speak, walk, tell time. Uh, you know, having to live roughly 29 years in that state, just kind of felt like this was the obvious solution. We spread her ashes over the vineyard. That way, she kind of comes back in the form of uh, vines and grapes, and she gets to travel the world now, see other places. There's not that much of it, really. We, uh, our first year, we're only doing about 100 cases of it. I'm gonna pull the first one off the bottling line and uh, stick it away. I'll probably take the second one and send it to her mother, because she'll want this, she'll want this bottle. Um, I'm a little numb at the moment. This is not, uh, yeah. special day. Spending the last five years getting to this point, you know, since the first day that we met and we looked over your vineyard before there were vines there, um, it was, it's been a long haul and uh, I'm definitely proud to be here with you. I'm glad we pulled this off, man. My name is Hugh Chappelle and I'm the winemaker at Linmar Estate in the world famous Russian River Valley. Our wines routinely get great scores from the critics, but the most important thing to us is staying true to our winemaking style and philosophy. We are right now on our home estate, Quail Hill Vineyard, in the heart of the Russian River Valley, one of the largest freshwater wetlands in Northern California. This area really is perfect for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And while we're most widely known as a specialist in Pinot Noirs, a Chardonnay recently got a 93 from the Wine Spectator. You're asking me uh, how critics come up with the numbers for, for their wines. Hi, my name is Steve Heimoff, and my job is to taste all the California wines. I have never tasted an Arizona wine to the best of my memory. So are you, are you gonna ask me which is Arizona and which is California? You guys are gonna bust me. I'm definitely not fond of wine scores. I, uh, it's like saying, uh, just because you like this, everybody else should like this. They're, they're incredibly politically influential. 
Um, a lot of times you, 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 pour, you give your wines to people who have palates that have developed around specific regions and you give them something a little different and the next thing you know, they don't like that wine because they've been drinking the same stuff their whole lives. And wine scoring, I don't know if political is the word I would use, but certainly uh, style driven. Well, when a critic comes up with a, a score for a wine, they're trying to give it an honest evaluation on whatever scale makes sense to them. The one that's most predominant here in the United States is 100 points. Thank you. Smells good, smells clean, smells rich. Some good fruit. It's a very nice red wine. It's very dry, it's fruity, it's balanced, it's complex, it has a long finish. Uh, it's got some nice uh, blackberry, black cherry, and spice, and uh, I think it's quite a good wine. You actually can hire companies that they advertise. They have a formula, a recipe you can follow that will help you develop a uh, point-driven wine. There's been wines that have scored 60s and 70s, but uh, you don't really hear about them because as soon as somebody gets that score, they just try to pretend it never happened, uh, of course. Uh, this doesn't strike me as quite as rich and uh, complex as the first wine. It's a little earthy, dusty. For the same reason that people look for the, the thumbs up from the movie critic, uh, people look for uh, these days a 90 point score or above from a wine critic for, as a sort of validation. But it really comes down to your palate. You really have to decide what you like. Um, and if you have a Walmart palate, then you have a Walmart palette. That's fine. You have to trust what you what you like. Uh, the wine is also not all that satisfactory uh, once it's in my mouth. If we could get rid of scores altogether, would that be a good thing? Probably. The problem is that they're really useful for consumers who don't have the time and energy to maybe sometimes even read a tasting note. I mean, they're a good guy, they're a good starting point, but if you really are serious about your wines, um, you really need to get to know the palate of the person who's scoring the wines. I kind of like that too. I kind of like that too. It's, uh, it's dry, which is good. It's balanced. It's round. It has a, a, a certain creamy mouthfeel that I like. Uh, there's certainly a good uh, explosion of berry cherry fruit in there, but uh, it's not a fruit bomb. It's not jammy. Uh, the fruit seems to be balanced uh, with earthier uh, spices and tobacco and maybe even something that seems leathery, but it's, it's a very nice wine. A lot of people go home with 90 point scoring wines or 92 point scoring wines or even 100 point scoring wines and they think, where did that score come from? I hate this wine. The American palate and all these rating systems always seem to focus on massive. It's like only women with big tits are good looking. You know, I'm just not, a, I'm not a big tit kind of guy. It doesn't give me any joy to bash a wine. Although I will say that sometimes it gives me a little joy to bash a $200 bottle of wine. We're not chasing the market. We're not chasing Parker scores. We're not chasing wine enthusiasts and spectator scores. We're making wines that we love to make. And we're gonna always do that here. It's just it's the way it is. What we're doing and what we're presenting will we're like an indie band. We'll sell our we'll sell our CDs. We're fine. Here is the mission from Pucifer on 101X. What do you know? Major James Keenan and Eric Glomsky have come into the studios today. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for uh, stopping off this afternoon. Hi. Explain to everyone in Austin, Texas, exactly what you're doing here. Well, we're here promoting our winery. Arizona Stronghold's our joint project. Um, I've got Page Spring Cellars, Maynard Heads Caduceus, and we're here to share our wines with people. So when you guys are putting together and, and making your wines, picking the grapes, what are you trying to put on the table and, and get out like, to the public? It's like writing a song. You just want to let the sounds happen in a room and, and go with them. Whatever Arizona on this particular spot on the globe wants to offer up for flavors, that's what we're gonna do. We let the grape speak for itself. Guys, thank you for coming to Austin. 
Had to came out to Arizona last year to meet you guys, so this was a shorter trip from Oklahoma. So these chupacabras can really use like a year aging if, uh, if you're so disciplined. Their reason for buying the wine is because of something I said a couple years ago. That's fine because uh, the wine is good, and, and they'll discover a whole new world that has nothing to do with Eric or I, mm -hmm. and uh, it'll be just a good a good step forward for them as far as expanding their awareness in the universe. Don't use a straw, though. Actually, use a glass. Gentlemen, thank you so much for stopping by. Arizona Stronghold is the wine, and you can find it at azstronghold.com. Yep. Correct? And, and caduceus.org. Caduceus.org. So there it is, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Guys, welcome to San Antonio. It's good to have you in town today. Thanks for having us. When your fans, music fans, are coming up to these signings, you've been doing it, what, what's the process at the wine signings, I guess? Is... We tend to kind of offend people a little bit, <laughs> getting them through, and like, you know, yeah, if yeah. they have a quick question, that's mm -hmm. great. We try to offer up as they're buying, looking at the wines they're buying, we tell them quickly what, you know, what to do and what not try to do. Try this with, with me, these. don't chill it, you know, no, right, start right. this way. Don't pass out. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. You can see the expectations in their eyes yeah. at times. And not to mention, a lot of them are nervous. <laughs> yeah, I know. You're gonna be famous. I know. There you go. Not that cool. Thank you. you got it? Enjoy. Thank you. You know, coming up to this this icon of theirs, and and they kind of bottle up, and then you hand them this bottle, and they they shuffle off, and you can see they wanted to say the right thing or whatever, and it didn't happen. So yeah. you know, there's some disappointment as people leave. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I have mixed feelings about it. This is more personal than somebody just buying a bottle of wine off a shelf somewhere because it's a pretty label or whatever. On the other hand, I thought it'd be fun if you guys interviewed people on the way out and would say, Do you, did any of you know who that other guy sitting next to Maynard was? <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting study of people who might or might not have been into wine, but maybe they'll actually go try the wine in spite of the signature and discover a whole new world that has far more to do with art and cuisine than it does with uh, uh, short-tempered rock stars. Do that, uh, do the, the wine, wine song. song. Do that one wine. I was perusing the interweb the other day in the search of new and interesting forms of pornography, and I came across something very interesting that juxtaposed against Aunt Mama's missionary position on alcohol. Oh, she didn't like alcohol. No, she did not, but this here fact kind of undermines that position, which I assume is a bad position. The key figure in her mythology of Mr. Jesus apparently used to turn water into wine. No shit. Yes, and I have an idea. I'm looking around the room here. I see a lot of people with Aquafina. I'm thinking if we find Jesus and get him down here, we can take that Aquafina, turn it into wine, take this punk rock party up a notch. What do you say? I say, hey, Jesus! Maynard has really two completely different persona, I feel, live. With Pustifer, he almost has a more, like, Andy Kaufman is a good example, a very provocative, humorous persona where you're really never sure exactly, you know, where the fourth wall is. Is Maynard kidding with some of these things? Is he trying to push your buttons? He really has this completely other identity with his newer stuff. I've built an entire career on not giving away the whole farm as far as explanation. It's, it's, it's been an element of, uh, I'll give you I'll, I'll present to you a particular odor and throw it out in the air, and, and then you, you know, have some kind of sense memory of those shapes, colors, sizes, sounds, and you and you draw on your own experience. And then if you have, if there's missing pieces, and you're the kind of person that likes to ask questions, there's going to be a lot for you to discover.
We have just received some exciting news. The folks making this here movie have reached out to Mr. James Suckling, a world-famous wine writer. In case you don't know, Mr. Suckling writes for a magazine called The Wine Spectator. They decided it would be a neat experiment to bring Mr. Suckling to town all the way from Italy to wet his whistle with some good old Arizona juice. Never wants to back down from a challenge, Maynard and Eric are getting everything ready for Mr. Suckling's visit. I heard tell once some TV yokels called this beautiful region a shit world. Well, that made me madder than a wet hen. So let's pay close attention and see how it all turns out. Shall we begin? Let's do the business. <laughs> My name's James Suckling. I'm the European bureau chief of the Wine Spectator, which is the biggest wine magazine in the world. We have two million readers. In a year, I might taste five, 6,000 wines. But you know, that's my day job. Uh, what I really enjoy is uh, sharing great bottles of wine with friends. So that's what I do. This is my little concoction. This is the Premier Passo from Caduceus. And this is pure Arizona fruit. I yes. told Ken a little bit what it was. Mm. I believe the blend is 90 or 91% Syrah, 9 or 10% Mavisia Bianca. This is oh, OK. Just we don't co-ferment. We put the Mavisia in uh, near the end. I like it, but I don't find it has that much Syrah character yet for me. And also the Malvasia, I think it gives it a little bit, the, it's quite a strong character, particularly in the nose Malvasia. And so I'm not sure that that works 100%. You can say that, it's all right. <laughs> maybe you're, I won't kick you out. Maybe you're trying to be, trying too hard on this one. Not at all, I love this wine. <laughs> <laughs> I make what I like. So the, the next wine is Mangus, which is our project. This was just bottled, so it's really young. 55% Cab, 36 Sangio, 9 Merlot. Well, the Sangio Basi really comes out in the nose. I think so too, despite the fact that the Cab is the dominant varietal. That floral and dried cherry character. Well, as you know, I'm, since I live in Italy, particularly Tuscany, I know a bit about uh, Sangiovese. They grow out there? They grow out there. <laughs> That's the holy grail, baby. Yes, it is. So I think you guys are really on a good track with Sangiovese. I don't think California is doing many Sangioveses like that. Yeah. I mean, what a, what a view. I had no right. idea with, and these terraces, so much work, it's crazy. Yep. I mean, it must have cost a fortune to, to yeah, plant them. Pretty much. You, you really don't see something like this in Napa Valley. I mean, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't really know. I don't really. I've never spent really any time in Napa, to be honest. Really? I was, I was maybe a day. Uh, I've been asked that a lot, like how much time you know I'm not spending spend a lot of time in Napa, but I, uh -huh. I haven't really. Yeah, because it, it's funny for me. I mean, I've been to Napa, of course, but as you know, uh, I live in Europe and I've been there 25 years seen all the great vineyards live in Italy. But for me, you know, it feels like, like parts of Europe, maybe parts of the Rhone Valley, but and this looks volcanic even. Were you saying that this is volcanic soil? Yeah, absolutely. If you look at a topographical map here, you'll see 
hundreds of volcanoes through the, up this area, basically from about this area north, up past Flagstaff, up toward, or toward the Grand Canyon. It's just uh, it's amazing. It looked like it looks like pimples. Yeah, this is pumice. And what's funny is it reminds me of vineyards I've been to a number of times in Sicily on the hillsides of uh, Etna, the okay. volcano. Never That's been. cool. I mean, it's off the charts. Judith. This, this is 100% uh, Cabernet. And this is named after your mom? Yes. Yeah, so I really like the spearmint, eucalyptus, mint character. It reminds me of some of the classic Cabernets from Napa Valley, like Heights and other wines, even old Mondavis. They came from the floor there, vineyards on the floor of Oakville. Here. Let's see what it tastes like. Classic cab grown at almost 5,000 feet. Whoa. Finally. All the bullshit you used to make from California. Thanks, James. <laughs> 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 no, but this tastes like something interesting. Don't you remember the first time I met you? Was it a cab you gave me? Yeah. We met at Chateau Marmont's. Yeah. And you go, what do you think of this wine? I just go, get out. <laughs> no, it wasn't that mean. I said, you can do better. Yeah. I said, it tastes like a lot of other things. Right. But this has that real current cassis, more of Bordeaux, but something, you know, a little bit different. And when you think of Arizona, hello. Granite edge. You know? I'm just not so sure it goes with roadkill. You just don't know. <laughs> is that coming for dinner tomorrow night? No, but seriously, this this is pretty like? impressive. Yes. Thank you. Cheers. Judith would be happy to hear that. What I like about a lot of wines is there's a story behind it. Wine is a evocative, consumable product. You drink it and you think of where it's from. The Judith I really like because not only is it a very, very good wine, I love the structure and the and the character. But it, I love the story about, about Maynard's mom, and that's really touching. But I also appreciate where the wine's from. I've walked in the vineyards, I've touched the soil, I've smelled the flowers, the, the area, and now in my mind and in my heart, it'll always be there. Wine is a time machine, particularly when you drink old wines. And I've had wines from 1865, and you drink it and you think, my God, this wine is so beautiful. It has such flavor. But then at the same time, you think about when it was made and what happened. The Judith, when I drink that wine, it's there. It brings it back right away. I'm back there in the vineyards with Maynard tasting it. I mean, it's early days, but I'm really happy and I'm excited for you know, for Maynard, because, you know, he's a friend and, and I wish him the best. And, you know, and I just, and I'm happy that it's just not a whim, because, you know, you know, friends and also artists like Maynard, you know, you can do whimsical things. And I think that, in fact, I'm going away knowing that my friend actually is doing something serious and that it's all going to be okay. I got a question for you. What kind of tool do you have to be to live out in the desert, Nick? Why? This doesn't taste like wine. It smells and tastes like shit. If you guys weren't relatives, you know, I used not. to play guitar, and my band, we had better had songs that we were many more songs than that than you had. Sing us your song. My song for the songs that we had uh, better. I remember that fucking band that came out. Your band was. MTV. What is your fucking band? And we we had a. It would have been better if we played if we t could tour, but they wouldn't let us tour. So. Good luck. Thanks Best. for being here. Thanks so much for coming. That's all we have for focus on interesting <sighs> things.
In 20 years from now, will Maynard be remembered as the man who launched the Arizona wine craze and like Tool is a footnote? Probably not, but anything is possible. I think that he's got his hands in so many things right now that sort of the legacy of Maynard is still really up for grabs. And I think that that's what he's probably not consciously doing, but think, I mean, he, he's a man creating his legacy beyond Tool right now, even though Tool is still going strong. Maynard, we haven't told you this yet, but we were in LA shooting the interesting things, you know, the interview. Yeah. And we were approached by a reality show producer, a big, big time producer. He works one of the biggest. With, yeah. One of the biggest. He works with. You're not Roland Carey, or? No, just checking the light. Okay. Um, this guy's huge. He worked. He's worked with Mark Burnett since the beginning. We're talking Survivor. We're talking The Apprentice. He, he's basically the biggest guy in reality TV. And, um, you know, he saw a trailer of this film, Blood and the Wine, and he's kind of, I don't know, he put an offer on the table uh, to do a reality show, to turn this film into a reality show. Just kind of take it from here and just keep going, keep the crews here. Really tell the story further. Uh, and we were thinking that, you know, it'd obviously be huge for wine sales and for money. We'd all make millions, probably. Yeah. Is that appealing to you in any way? Or what are your thoughts about that? The only reason people are gonna know that I'm out here on my knees digging holes and making wine and you know cultivating grapes is because you have a camera on me. That's the only that's the only reason. And who knows? I mean it's a camera. Who knows what happened when the camera was off? We could set this whole thing up, it could be all bullshit. I might this might be my first time on this location. You don't know. As soon as the camera's on, people act different. It's just the it's the nature of reality TV. This may not be how I am. People get into winemaking all the time with, no, with such little knowledge of what this really entails, okay? I mean, th I mean, think about this, really. W when people see, when they think of a winemaker, okay, I think sometimes they think of the salt of the earth kind of guy, but a lot of times they, they think of somebody sniffing wine and pontificating and, you know, the nose in the air and all that stuff. You guys might even have some shots like that. But, you know, 90% of winemaking is labor, okay? It's hard labor. So why am I not in Vegas with hookers and pina coladas at the pool at the Hard Rock Hotel? Look at me. We reserve that, those kind of things for good-looking people. I'm not, I'm not the beautiful people. I'm the hard-working guy. I'm, not, I'm, gonna have to, I'm gonna have to till this soil. I don't, nothing I get comes easy, and I don't see life as you get to a certain point, and then you just kind of level it off and coast. There is no such thing as coasting in life. There's always gonna be a curveball. It's always going to be change and chaos. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I think that uh, chaos and change is good. It took people seven years to get Tool. It took people seven years to get Perfect Circle. It'll take people seven years to get Pussifer. And it takes seven years to see a dollar out of a bottle of wine that we're making here. It's just a, a, natural, a natural process and a perfect number to assign to that learning curve. I'm alive still, and there's so much, so much to learn, so much to know, so much to explore. Um, I can't really, I just, I guess I just can't really sit still. I'd like to think that I've played a role in helping him take steps. I think with each year we get closer to him operating independently. It's gonna take me many years to really learn how to make wine on my own, and so getting out of the nest is gonna be really important. Eric's gonna be a key factor in that. He's, he's my mentor, he's gonna be the one that's gonna help me with that footing, and that's that step of the stronghold that we're establishing. I'd like to be able to present him a bottle of wine that I made by myself and have him give me the nod that uh, I've, I've accomplished something uh, on my own. And then it would be more of a matter of us both having our businesses side by side and calling, you know, being like the old men and calling each other up and saying, oh, you know, have you tried this yet? And I did this last week and it worked great and, you know, stuff like that. And, and that's where I see us. I, I see us as guys who are gonna get this place dialed and other people will, will come along after us and, and take advantage of what we learn, but I think we're gonna stay at the forefront of it because we're both very motivated, ambitious people and we're curious. And, you know, because this isn't just about making money, this isn't just about getting our, our names on some plaque that says, here's the guys who, who did this. It's more about our own innate curiosity and drives and, and interest in, in the world. I think I could probably speak uh on behalf of Eric on this one and say, fuck no. You 
You know, when this is a, a wrap, uh, I want to get back to my life. I mean, I don't know if you noticed over the course of this whole film, but I'm not really much of a people person, so this is not really what I like. Uh, and head back to the cave, um, get back to work, and, you know, shoot trespassers, you included. But, I mean, I, obviously we respect your, your feelings. Um, I mean, we'd handle it artfully. Um, and, uh, I mean, do you feel like this film, Blood and the Wine, we're at the end of the movie now, do you feel like it's told your, your story, you and Eric, as, as winemakers? I mean... As artists, it's Eric and my job to observe, interpret, and report as sensualists in whatever medium that may be. And it's our hope that over the course of this film, you've had a little glimpse into our process, our creative journey, and our journey of self-discovery. And hopefully it will inspire you to either continue your journey or to start your journey towards self-discovery. And hopefully we'll see you down in Arizona Bay. to come.